They're mega pit stops and a home away from home for heavy haulers. Offering everything from automated showers. Shower number five is now ready. To a treasure trove of chrome. To your very own electrified parking space. Massive scales. Inspections on the fly. And revolutionary fuel that'll get you on the road again. Well, the truckers tell me they do get better gas mileage. Buckle up. It's time to get trucking. Now, truck stops on Modern Marvels. trucks. Each year in the United States, they travel over 1.5 trillion miles, hauling more than 11 billion tons of freight. That's more than $9 trillion worth of cargo. Any product that you buy in a store, it got to that location by a truck. What I always go by is without trucks, America stops. Just as trucks keep America moving, an army of more than three million men and women keep the trucks rolling. These weary road warriors spend weeks cooped up in a cab, but they have an oasis on the road, the truck stop. We have to have some place to park, place to eat, do laundry, take a shower, uh, do something besides sit here and hold the steering wheel. When the normal person goes home from their day of work, they like to sit in their easy chair and relax. Well, that's what truck stops offer the drivers. Drivers can really kick up their feet at the Iowa 80 truck stop in Walcott, Iowa. Build is the world's largest truck stop. It plays host to more than 5,000 truckers every day. Iowa 80 sprawls across 225 acres, four times the area covered by the average truck stop. That's two and a half times the size of Disneyland. There are enough parking spaces here for 800 rigs. And the main building spans more than 70,000 square feet. The fuel center alone is double the size of most truck stops. It can dispense diesel to 15 big rigs at once, around the clock. Now it's time to fuel a truck. Do it the same way you do when you gas your car up. Put in the truck number the mileage, and the driver ID. This authorizes the pump so that they know who's using it. Then you simply turn on the pump, open up your tank, and put your nozzle in. But we as truckers have one more thing we can do. Let me show you a trick. Most trucks have two fuel tanks. So when it comes time to fuel the other side, we can come over and use another pump. These dual dispensers can fuel both tanks simultaneously. One dispenser is a master unit that controls the fueling and records the sale. The fuel flows from the underground tank through a metering system in the master dispenser and then on to both nozzles. A pipe from the master unit carries the fuel underground to the other dispenser, called the satellite unit. Took 167 gallons, about $440 worth. Fuel's expensive, but without fuel, these trucks are not going to move. This will last me probably 1,200 miles, so I probably won't need to fuel for probably another 24 to 36 hours. Before dual-sided pumps became an industry standard in the late 1980s, fueling the passenger side tank was anything but a gas. We'd have to take the hose and throw it underneath the truck. It sometimes get full of dirt, so we'd have to clean the dirt out. Now that we have two pumps, it goes so much faster and is so much cleaner, too. After drivers fuel up at Iowa 80, they can head on over to the Truckomat. It's just the spot for big rigs that need big baths. Truck and trailer, boys. Truck and trailer. All right. The truck wash uses a combination of manpower and machine power. We hand scrub the rigs because it's the more traditional way of doing it, but the sides of the trailers have to be scrubbed. And if we did it by hand, it would take 20 minutes probably. So we fabricated this machine to do that for us. The brush comes out with air power and it spins and it does the sides of the trailers. As the machine's going, we don't have to do anything. We just do our job and the machine will do its job and 
That's it. Washers even clean under the hood. Wielding a high pressure wand, it sprays more than 1,500 pounds per square inch of water. That's 50 times stronger than the average garden hose. It's 180 degree water, takes off all the grime and salt and oil and whatnot that collects on the engine. And it helps them find oil leaks and other fluent leaks they might have. After less than 15 minutes of scrubbing leaves his rig squeaky clean, the truck driver finds a parking spot to let it air dry. Iowa 80 has come a long way since it opened in 1964. Bill Moon, a regional manager for Standard Oil, selected the site for his company. It was strategically located along the emerging Interstate 80. I-80 was to stretch from San Francisco almost 3,000 miles east across the country to become one of America's first interstate routes. A critical artery spanning all the way to New York City. When Iowa 80 opened, however, traffic was light and so was the demand for truck stops. We started out and we had maybe two gas pumps and about three diesel pumps. We had a small store and parking for maybe eight or 10 trucks and that was it. In 1984, Moon purchased the truck stop from the oil company. Under his management, the site flourished and innovated. You know, in here is one of the best things I've ever found in a truck stop. It's the trucker store. This 30,000 square foot showroom is the trucking industry's Bloomingdale's. Stocked with chrome, stainless steel, and more lights than the Vegas Strip. As we do our yards and as we fix our house up, truck drivers feel that way about their trucks. They're in them all year round, and they want to make them look nice. The showroom features a wall 20 feet tall and 40 feet wide, displaying 500 illuminated LED lights. Although safety regulations dictate that every tractor trailer be equipped with at least 22 lights, many truckers like to light up their rigs like Christmas trees. And if they're shopping for a different kind of dazzle, three decked out semis flaunt the trucker's delight. Chrome, that protective shiny metal that makes rigs glisten in the sun. We've added a lot of chrome accessories to these show trucks. We have full fenders to a step, six inch stacks, and of course the custom front bumper. Chrome is slang for chromium, a highly reflective blue-white metal resistant to tarnish and corrosion. It's added to other metals like aluminum to form a protective and attractive covering through a process called electroplating. First, the aluminum part is wired to the negative pole of a battery and chromium to the positive pole. Next, both metals are immersed in a solution of chromic and sulfuric acid to permit the flow of electricity. Since the aluminum is negatively charged, it attracts the positively charged chromium. Automakers in the 1950s began using chrome to produce cars with a flashier appeal. Soaring tail fins and grinning wide-mouthed grills lined the highways, and chrome became a household word. Today, chrome has taken a back seat in passenger car design. But modern big rigs carry on its glistening legacy. After dishing out their dough on a sparkling chrome accessory, drivers can retire to the trucker's area. It's home to 23 private shower rooms, a driver's den, a 60-seat Dolby surround sound movie theater, and a barber shop. There's even a dentist. If there is such a thing called an emergency room of dental care, this would be it. I'm usually the truck driver's best friend because I am taking them out of pain. Although perks like a dentist and a barber may entice a driver to pull into this mega pit stop, a home-cooked meal can really draw a crowd. The uh, restaurant's the heartbeat of the truck stop. Drivers like comfort food and they like large portions and they, they want to feel like they're getting a lot for their money. The Iowa 80 Kitchen Restaurant serves more than a million cups of coffee, two million eggs, and 90 tons of meat each year. 
When you can find a truck stop that's got homemade food, boy, you live for that. I'm gonna live high on the hog today. This type of roadside pit stop dates back to the 1920s. As cars and trucks began dominating America's roads, the original mom and pop truck stops sprouted up. They catered to truck drivers by providing just the basics, food, fuel, and a mattress. They'd have bunk rooms, basically a spare room in the back of the station where people would be pretty crammed in, but it was a, a place to rest for the night. The trucking industry had gotten a jump start during World War I, fueled by America's need for efficient transport. As military traffic clogged the nation's rail lines, trucks started to crowd the roads to make shorter hauls. You had thousands of trained new drivers, as well as thousands of vehicles that were created for the war effort. So the industry really took hold and expanded rapidly. By 1935, about 40% of all communities were dependent upon truck service. More mom and pop truck stops started dotting America's local highways. But by the end of World War II, these small operations were primed to be supersized. The return of the nation's GIs and the post-war building boom made it clear that the U.S. highway system could never effectively absorb truck traffic stretching from coast to coast. Though more than 200 highways crisscrossed the United States in the 1950s, they were jammed with vehicles and inadequately designed for the era's faster and wider trucks. The Federal Interstate Highway Act of 1956 changed that by launching the creation of a national system of superhighways that promised a quicker means of moving goods. The launching of the interstate system really resulted in some mega stops. Truck stops no longer became something feasible for an independent owner to construct and run. It was when the oil companies really got into the, the game big time. When Standard Oil opened Iowa 80 truck stop in 1964, it sat on roughly five acres. Since then, its owners have developed more than 75 acres, reserving plenty of room to expand. But there's more to an ultimate truck stop than size. How about a high-tech hookup that not only makes a trucker's life a breeze, but also could save more than a billion gallons of diesel each year? The average truck stop in the United States takes in about $7.8 million in revenue each year. Truck Stops will return on Modern Marvels. The truck stop at night. From a distance, it seems peaceful and serene. But up close, it's a deafening hum of idling engines. Truckers idle their engines for various reasons, including keeping the heat on in the winter, the air conditioning on in the summer, powering their laptops, their DVD players, charging up their cell phones. Idling trucks burn about a gallon of diesel every hour. And America's army of truckers idle away 1.7 billion gallons of diesel every year. Idling also adds wear and tear to the engine. And not surprisingly, dumps pollutants into the atmosphere. One company thinks it has a better idea. Idle Air allows truckers to shut off their engines while still powering up their toys. Idle Air is advanced truck stop electrification. Basically what we've done is devised a way to deliver all the creature comfort services to a parked truck. At the Petro Travel Stop in Knoxville, Tennessee, 114 trucks can plug into Idle Air. All drivers need is a $10 window adapter to connect to the system. One of my favorite things about using the idle air is that it enables me to turn the engine off at night uh, so that I don't have to listen to that rumbling and the constant vibration in the truck. You sleep a lot better. I typically spend two to three months at a time out on the road. So the idle air to me with the internet access and the phone hookup on it uh, allows me to keep in touch at home. The system also offers games, movies on demand, and more than 60 TV channels, so drivers can keep up with their favorite shows. But there's more to the system than drive-in entertainment. There's also a heater air conditioner, 
Every idle air unit sits above a parking space along a truss or support structure. A hose connects each unit to a service delivery module that provides individual electrical service. Idle Air's inventor, A.C. Wilson, came up with his initial concept in 1999 while vacationing with his brother-in-law, a long-haul trucker who just received a ticket for idling. I went to bed that night thinking more about it. Uh, you know, how can I help these truckers? At 4.30 in the morning, I woke up and I said, here I am in my motorhome. I'm just as comfortable as a bug in a rug. Why can't I do that for the trucker? Wilson went to work and created his first prototype, a surface-mounted unit with a hose that ran up into the window, providing climate control and power. We quickly saw that in order to package these services together, we would need to do it overhead so that we could distribute these systems safely. Engineers took Wilson's brainchild one step further, developing an advanced delivery system. This duct set is a concentric duct. Basically, the supply air will be delivered to the driver through this center tube, whereas the return air will pass through here and then past our advanced filtration technology. At an hourly rate of $1.85, the system saves about $1 an hour in fuel, plus wear and tear on the engine. And it greatly reduces all those greenhouse gases floating skyward. The Whitehall Air services more than 100 locations in 30 states. That's still only about 2% of all truck stops. Truck stop electrification programs are hard to find for the average truck driver today. So therefore, most truck drivers, or a lot of truck drivers, are, are going with generators or APUs to provide the power that they need for their sleepers. An APU, or auxiliary power unit, is a small motor fueled by the same diesel that runs the engine in the tractor. If you idle one of these big engines, you're going to use up to a gallon of fuel an hour. With an APU, you're going to be maybe one quart an hour, and you will achieve the same thing. These portable power systems installed right onto the truck have enabled some rigs to become downright lavish. My favorite thing in this truck is my fireplace. Um, in the cold winters, it's just so cozy, and I love to read. It keeps you nice and warm. It just feels like you're at home. Truckers have traveled a long, hard road getting to a luxury sleeper like this one. Before trucks had room for beds, drivers had to literally sleep where they worked. A driver really had nothing available to him. Laying a board across both seats in the early days and sleeping on that was fairly common practice. In 1917, Goodyear introduced the first sleeper cab. They were very small at first, basically it was just a bed. And as the years go by, uh, the manufacturing of truck companies started making bigger and bigger sleepers. You know, basically just a place for a TV and a bigger bed, uh, some storage. Today, almost all long-haul drivers spend the night at truck stops, tucked in their very own sleeper. Some drivers have taken their sleepers to the extreme with custom upscale compartments, like this big bunk, manufactured at ARI Legacy Sleepers in Shipshawana, Indiana. These custom sleepers come fully equipped with a space-saving shower and toilet combo. Talk about multitasking. I love the toilet in the truck because then I don't have to go to rest areas. And I love the shower. I have about a 40 gallon tank. And so I can have one every day. This here has uh, an on and off switch. So you, while you're washing your hair, you can turn the water off, but yet keep the, the temperature of the water. Having your own private restroom isn't the only perk in these digs. We also have what we call the bed dinette. It just folds back down and you have a 48 inch mattress to sleep on. We have a sink with solid surface countertop, hot and cold running water. We also have an electric two burner stove in this unit. And over here we have a refrigerator and freezer with a microwave convection oven. You can actually bake cookies in this. We also have a 26 inch LCD widescreen TV with surround sound. And when you're ready to go back to work, just step up into the business center. 
ARI's standard 132-inch long sleeper will run you about $70,000. Maybe that's why less than 1% of truckers currently enjoy the creature comforts they offer. Whether they accommodate luxury sleepers or more modest rigs, truck stops continue to sprout up across America. And it's no easy task to create the supersized equipment that keeps them trucking along. If rigs idled at all 272,000 truck stop parking spaces across the nation, their emissions would amount to more than 11 million tons of pollutants each year. Truck stops will return on Modern Marvels. Every night, more than 250,000 truckers pull into truck stops for refuge. And every one of them needs a place to tuck in his rig for the night. But there's a problem. Truck stops in many U.S. states don't have enough parking space. So engineers are busy at work developing new sites. They're built from below the ground up, beginning with the most indispensable assets of any truck stop, the diesel tanks. Here on my left is an 8-foot diameter, 10,000-gallon fuel storage tank, typical of what you would find at your neighborhood gas station. Compared to that, on my right is a 30,000-gallon tank that is typical of a truck stop. This tank is 20 feet longer in length. It's 2 feet larger in diameter. It's a 10-foot diameter tank and it's triple the capacity. At Containment Solutions in Bakersfield, California, tank manufacturing fabricators construct these 30,000-gallon double-walled truck stop tanks one piece at a time. What you see going on behind me is the rotation of our steel mandrel, which is the basis of tank forming. We apply resin, glass fibers, and treated silica to build a composite laminate that is formed on this mold in uh, multiple passes. Next, fabricators add plastic reinforcing ribs to the mold. Wrapped with the same fiberglass materials, these ribs give the tank all the strength it needs for its long life underground. After the tank sections are cured, workers pull them from the mold seal them together, and pressure test them to ensure that they won't leak fuel. Any leak could prove environmentally disastrous, since the tanks of a typical truck stop dispense a whopping one million gallons of diesel over the course of a month. And the pumps tapping into them fuel four times faster than those at a neighborhood gas station. In a kind of mechanical symbiosis, Completed tanks make their way to the truck stop on the beds of trucks. Once they're buried, the tanks are far from out of mind. Engineers can keep tabs on them using a monitoring system linked to this panel installed on the surface. What this device is is called an automatic tank gauge. And what it has is a series of probes and sensors that are in various portions of the underground storage tank system. Every tank has a probe in it that measures the inventory levels in the tank. The probe is basically an aluminum tube that is the entire diameter of the tank. And they have a float that moves up and down on the probe. The system also has sensors installed within the double wall containment that detect any liquid leaking from the interior tank. The probes and sensors are hardwired to the console that analyzes and records the data. If the system senses a leak, an alarm will direct technicians to the problem. In the past, maybe the operator would go out once a day and stick the tank with a tank stick. Now it's all done electronically. This measures the tank level down to hundredths of an inch. On the pavement above the fuel tanks, truck stop designers face another problem. Making sure the swarm of big rigs can get in and out of the area efficiently. Like a parking lot for cars, truck stop parking lots are divided into parking spaces and drive aisles. But the drive aisles are more than double the width. As much as they'd like to, truck stop designers can't make the aisles much wider than that. 
because they have to optimize the available space. The trick to solving the problem is to understand a big rig's off-tracking, or turning ability. When a car makes a turn, it follows only one path. But when a tractor trailer turns, the front wheels of the tractor follow one path, and the rear wheels of the trailer take a completely different path toward the inside of the turn. The distance between these two paths, or the off-tracking, varies depending on the angle of the turn, the length of the trailer, and the speed of the truck. Knowing this, truck stop designers are able to maximize the parking lot space. If they can't park, they can't use the facility. And what's very important, once that driver comes on, um, they're going to stay at our location for half a day. That's because federal law specifies mandatory rest periods for truckers. After driving 11 hours, truck drivers must pull off the road and rest their weary eyes for 10 consecutive hours. Few truck stops come better equipped to meet their needs than Travel Centers of America, or TA. We start with very large properties. A typical uh, TA is about 25 acres. We take that survey and we put it onto a CAD, a computer-aided design, and we're able to maximize all parts of the location. During the planning of this TA in Lodi, Ohio, Designers considered every detail. The number one thing that comes up anytime we ask the drivers is just give me a nice, clean, well-designed shower and restroom. And these real marble showers are not only high class, but also high tech. Drive number 144, shower number seven is now ready. In the not so old days, drivers would have to line up to grab a spritz. Now they can order a shower in advance at the same place they fuel up. And with the purchase of 50 gallons of diesel, the shower's on the house. The customer's been on the road for many, many hours. All they want to do is park their truck and be refreshed. And to be able to take care of that driver very, very quickly, that's important. TA has been innovating for 35 years. The company began as Truck Stops of America in the early 1970s, as the mystique of the trucker began to grow. Truckers were seen as the last American cowboys. They were these loners out on the road, and truck stops were where you could, you know, mingle with them. As more and more motorists started pulling off the interstates to check out the trucker's lifestyle, truck stop owners realized they had been missing out on something big the business of the average Joes. Truckers may be a truck stop's bread and butter clients, but they represent only 20% of highway traffic. To attract the other 80%, truck stops now call themselves travel centers. Trucks go in a completely different entrance, usually around back. And that's where the diesel is, that's where the trucker's entrance is. And that world is where the truck itself goes to the doctor. As a leading truck service provider, TAs come equipped with computer diagnostics. Their technicians can plug into the truck's onboard system to pinpoint problems. If the driver is complaining that something is wrong with the truck, I could click on fault codes and see if there's any fault codes coming up. There is a uh, ECU, which is the engine control unit, 128, and it's a PID, and it's a parameter identifier, and the ID is 111, and it's coolant level. The technology has advanced so much, the technicians can actually take control of the truck with their PCs. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to click on the bulkhead module, and the bulkhead module is the brains of the truck. A click of the mouse can operate the windshield wipers. And you can see the wipers are working on low, and it's also giving me an amp output as to how much amperage is drawing. If the amperage is too much, I can see it on the screen, indicating there's a problem. With innovative tech like this available at truck stops, drivers can get a quick fix on their rig and keep on rolling. Back on the open road, however, highway checkpoints can bring these metal behemoths to a halt. But new technology is allowing drivers to keep their 18 wheels turning with inspections on the fly. 
In 1968, the United States had about 2,000 truck stops. By 1972, more than 3,800. And today, there are more than 6,000 U.S. truck stops. Truck stops will return on Modern Marvels. This big boy needs to weigh in. And he can do that right at the truck stop. Hello? Welcome to our lady. Is this your first way? Yes, it is. What's your truck number? 1058. In just a fraction of a second, the automated scale calculates the weight of the heavy hauler. I have you weighed. Bring a trailer number in with you. Thanks. The federal maximum weight allowed for a tractor and trailer is 80,000 pounds. And drivers rely on scales at truck stops to keep their weight in check. Overweight trucks not only damage roads, but also pose grave dangers. The heavier the truck, the greater the distance and time it needs to stop. A 100,000-pound truck takes 25% longer to stop than an 80,000-pound truck. Way stations along the highway ensure trucks are within the legal limit. It's very important that we be here to be sure that weight is regulated properly. Any time that one of these tractor and trailers encounter uh, a regular passenger vehicle, of course, the passenger vehicle is going to lose, uh, no matter who is at fault. In 1913, Maine passed America's first law regulating truck weight. And by 1933, all states had some kind of truck weight limit. Modern truck scales consist of concrete and steel plates that rest on a set of load cells. A load cell converts force into a measurable electrical output. A load cell looks exactly like this. Inside the cell, you can see a stainless steel bar down the middle. Attached to it are strain gauges. What actually is measured by the cell is the compression of this stainless steel rod. As the truck drives onto the scale, the load cells compress, causing the strain gauges to deform and generate a change in voltage. This electrical signal is sent from each load cell through a device called a sectional controller and into the fuel center, where a computer digitally calculates the weight of the truck. The science of weighing heavy objects dates back to 200 BC, when the Romans invented the steel yard. They used it to weigh precious goods, like gold. The steel yard consisted of a beam with a sliding weight to counterbalance the load. Today, this type of device is still used in the modern scales at most doctor's offices. How about a doctor scale three stories high? These massive steel yards were developed in the 18th century to weigh wagons and rail cars. Commerce pushed the weighing of heavy items in the 1800s, just as if you would have a farm and you were hauling some type of produce, you would want to weigh that produce when you would buy it in bulk. But using steel yards was a daunting task because the vehicles had to be lifted up onto the scale. Innovators tried to devise an easier method and succeeded with the platform scale. In the 1830s, a gentleman named Thaddeus Fairbanks patented the first platform scale. Now, something such as a horse-drawn cart could be pulled directly onto the scale. The platform scale incorporated the principles of the steel yard with two levers supporting a platform. Pivot points at each corner of the scale allowed the force of the load to be transferred to both levers. The central lever pulled down on the steel yard that determined the weight of the load. In the late 1940s, the platform scale incorporated electronics. And today, load cells dominate the weighing industry. But the laborious process of stopping the weigh in is slowing truck traffic. <laughs> Especially since the number of big rigs on the road is skyrocketing, up more than 30% since 1993. This may be the answer to a trucker's prayers. 
The Oak Ridge National Lab in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, has integrated weigh-in motion technology and other sensor technologies to speed up the process. The system was first installed in 1995 at the nation's second busiest way station in Tennessee's Knox County. This is a weigh-in motion system. It's basically a metal plate that uh, is laying on a load cell and it can detect the weight of the truck uh, at pretty high speeds. Similar to the static scale, load cells capture the instantaneous force one axle at a time as the truck drives over them. But drivers never have to stop to weigh in. They can just roll right over the scale at 30 miles per hour. And only those trucks that are within 2,000 pounds of the legal limit or exceed it are pulled in for a more precise calculation. As he's coming up through there, you see he's got a good tag. Driver does have his seatbelt on, company name's on the side of the truck, his DOT number's there, and his fuel permit. Tires all look good. We we'll look down and check his weight. Weight looks good, so then I'll release him. Just 85 miles north at the Laurel County, Kentucky Way Station, Oak Ridge National Lab and Kentucky Vehicle Enforcement have deployed another advanced system that can both weigh and inspect the truck in motion. It even sniffs for bombs. So essentially what we're doing is placing the proper sensors out here, information that we can attain off of a truck in motion and provide that in a near instantaneous manner to the state police. As the truck pulls into the station, it travels over a weigh-in motion scale. Then it passes an infrared camera that checks the brakes. An infrared camera only sees heat. So heat is displayed as white and cold as black. Brakes work by producing heat from uh, motion energy. So if there is no heat, there is no brake. This is a, uh, a laser scanner that uh, collects information about the overall length of the truck, how many axles the truck has, and the speed of the truck. This is a uh, radiation detector. The radiation detector measures for gamma and neutron radiation. The radiation portal monitor can detect trace amounts of threat substances based on their radiation signature, all while the truck is in motion. This device can help prevent terrorists from transporting dirty bombs and biological warfare agents across the country. This is an automatic license plate recognition system that actually takes a pretty wide view of the front of the truck, finds the license plate, zooms in on it, takes the uh, text from the front of it and sends it to a database to be checked. In a matter of seconds, the station gathers enough information to give the truck a green light to exit or a red light to pull up for inspection. A way station can not only be a place that we do road preservation and highway safety, but can help us from the standpoint of homeland security, environmental protection, and highway congestion. Less congestion means less wasted diesel fuel. And one country music legend's truck stop venture may even get rigs back on the road again without relying on imported oil. The trucker's term for a way station is chicken coop. Rest areas are called nap traps, and the truck stop is known as the water hole. Truck stops will return on Modern Marvels. Truckers traveling down Interstate 35 between Dallas and Waco, Texas, seek out one of the most unique truck stops in the United States. Two things make Carl's Corner unusual. It's co-owned by country music legend Willie Nelson. And the fuel sold here, Bio Willie, is a biofuel that's 80% diesel and 20% vegetable oil. This clean-burning biodiesel blend reduces harmful exhaust emissions by more than 10%. And that's not the only advantage it offers. Well, the truckers tell me they do get better gas mileage, and that means more money in their pocket. So naturally, this is perks up their ears a little bit. Biodiesel is made through a chemical process called transesterification, in which glycerin is separated from oil through the use of a catalyst and an alcohol. We're going to make some biodiesel here. So I've got a beaker of uh, vegetable oil. We're going to put it on a stir plate, and I'm going to add in my uh, alcohol and catalyst mixture here. And let's see what happens.
you can see the oil got murky as it started to, um, the glycerin is starting to break from the biodiesel. And now it's turned a nice clear color, which means that most of the glycerin has separated from the methyl ester chains. And that's basically biodiesel right there. During the chemical reaction, a methanol molecule is attached to the fatty acid chain of vegetable oil. The three bonds of the glycerol molecule break off due to this interaction, resulting in three long methyl ester chains, or biodiesel. Carl's Corners sets itself apart not only by selling biodiesel, but also by producing it right at the truck stop. A newly constructed facility refines 8,000 gallons every day. Every unit of fossil fuel required to make biodiesel results in 3.2 units of energy gain. On the downside, biodiesel can gel in cold weather. So how did a brand of biodiesel named after a country music star get its start here? Let's go back to 1979. That's when a friend of Willie's, entrepreneur Carl Cornelius, opened Carl's Corner to fill the needs of passing truckers. I started one room at a time. You know, and if they asked for a swimming pool, I put it in. If they asked for a hot tub, put it in. If they asked for an adult bar, I put it in. For 25 years, the fuel at Carl's Corner, like at most truck stops, was conventional diesel. Then, Willie started learning about biodiesel. My wife, Annie, came to me one day and said, I want to buy this car, it's a Volkswagen Jetta. And it's a diesel, but it runs on vegetable oil. So she did, and it runs on vegetable oil. So I thought that was pretty good. Willie learned that any diesel engine can run on biodiesel. In fact, when inventor Rudolf Diesel presented the first diesel engine in 1900, it was designed to run not on petroleum, but peanut oil. But since petroleum was more commercially available in the early decades of the 20th century, the idea of biodiesel faded away. In recent years, however, many have recognized biodiesel's benefits. And in 2004, Nelson set out to create his own brand. And what better place to sell it than the truck stop owned by his buddy Carl? He was uh, thinking about closing the truck stop down, and so I called him and said, hey, wait a minute, let's sell some biodiesel down there. And I said, well, you believe in it? And he said, well, yeah, I believe in it. And I said, well, let's do the whole damn thing. I don't have the reason to sell diesel. Let's just sell biodiesel, and that's what we did. Carl partnered with both Willie and Earth Biofuels and made plans to update the truck stop. During 2006 and 2007, Carl's Corner got a major makeover, adding a new saloon and renovating an 850-seat theater so Willie can stop by and perform at any time. Thank you very much. Willie's place at Carl's Corner is what we as a company had envisioned would become the symbol of uh, the, the biofuels business and the integrated model we wanted to build. We're trying to show the farmers can bring it to market and the biodiesel plant is there. The truck stop is here, the interstate is here, and it's all locally owned, and uh, everything will stay in the community and not be sent off to somebody overseas or something. More and more truck stop owners are following Willie and Carl's example, offering biodiesel as an alternative fuel. Counted among the many innovations that have redefined these ever-evolving roadside oases, They'll continue to give drivers what they need so that they can do what they do best. Nie, to już nie fajnie, bo macha nie przyjdzie. Cześć, dobra.